Revelation and apocalypse are the same word in the Latin and the Greek. They just sound different if you say revelation or apocalypse. But they have the same meaning, an uncovering or a revealing. That's what revelation and apocalypse means. This uncovering isn't just for church leadership. It's meant for every believer in Jesus Christ. The question is, what's being uncovered? The real question is not what is being uncovered, but who is being uncovered. When you look in your Bible, it probably says the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the revealing of Jesus Christ to the world, to all that read this book. And so we understand it's not talking about uh, an apocalypse as in that's what's going to happen to the world. And oh yeah, we'll get to that. But that's not what the focus is. The focus is Jesus Christ and him being revealed. Um, he's the author of the book, by the way, Jesus. Well, God, through Jesus, through an angel, to John. Okay, so it, it sounds like it's a long way. Sometimes Jesus is speaking directly to John, and sometimes an angel is revealing things to John. But either way, all of this comes from God. We understand that the whole word of God is inspired by God. So regardless of where you are in the scriptures, God inspires it. And he inspired the writers to write what they wrote so that it would have the same meaning to us today than it had originally when the author penned it. Many of Paul's writings were written by scribes and those scribes wrote down what Paul told them, but Paul didn't come up with the content. It was the Holy Spirit that ministered to Paul so that Paul could write that content. So humans can't get the content as good as the Bible. AI can't write the Bible. You know, uh, uh, there, is, there is actually, if, if you saw my video or was here during my discussion on AI, uh, there is a guy that actually believes that AI will write a new Bible, one that's more friendly, one that's easier for people to get along with, and one that doesn't condemn people but includes everyone. And that's probably what's going to happen. That's probably the um, direction when we're talking about a one-world religion, one-world government, and then... AI being included, it's going to have everyone included in that. I just don't understand how that's going to happen, but I'm not concerned about it. When we look at Revelation, we have to understand that it's a literal book. Quite often people um, think it's allegorical. It's all metaphor, and that's how we're supposed to read. We can't understand it because it's allegory and metaphor. It's, it is what it is. It is what you make of it. But that's not how Revelation is written. It's not a historic book either, because some people believe that it's a historic book. But in my eyes, it's a futuristic book, because the events that took place that take place in the book of Revelation haven't taken place yet. When you read it, you can say, well, haven't seen that. Haven't seen the, the scorpions or the comets or the, the things that come from outer space and, and kill one-third of humanity. I, I haven't seen all of that. I haven't seen the rivers and the oceans turning to blood but 
preterists are historians and they believe this is all historical. And so we just have to take it at face value that it's literal because we're told that it is. Jesus explains to us that it's literal. The only time it's not literal is when John writes, and I saw something like. Now, can you imagine John, 95, 94 AD, you know, on an island getting these visions of modern day Israel, seeing what's going on right now in Israel, uh, you know, seeing that and wondering, what are those things up in the sky? W you know, what are these things that are being launched? He doesn't know. He tries to describe things to the best of his ability. And it would be hard for us even to try to equate what he was actually seeing or identify, oh, that must have been a missile that he's talking about. Um, you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, the flying scorpions, you know, head like a locust and stings, stingers coming out of it, that's probably a helicopter. Could have been. Or there's going to be something new. Don't know. Here's the thing I am comforted by. I'm not going to be here to find out. And I hope you're not either. So really, that's what it comes down to, is that this is talking about the future of what's going to happen to the earth after the rapture of the church. The rapture of the church is inevitable. It's uh, imminent. It's at any moment, basically. And as we watch what's going on in Israel right now, that just confirms, first of all, that the Bible is true. And second of all, that we're at that moment. We're watching everyone get in position for the final battle. You know, when you watch a chess game, sometimes the beginning of it is kind of boring. You know, un unless you have you know, a really good player and a really bad player, and in four moves the game is over. You know, there, there is that. But if you have two really good players and they're playing, sometimes the beginning is very boring, especially if you don't have a clock. And then they're playing and playing, and then you get down to those last few pieces on the board. Folks, we're at the last few pieces. We're at that time where um, there are 22 Arab countries. There's one Jewish country. There are 53 Muslim countries. There's one Jewish country. Really? You, you, you don't have enough land? You don't have enough of your own? property that you need to get rid of that one little piece there? Yes, because that's what the Bible says is going to happen. And it's happening right before us. So as we go into Revelation, we're looking at this. We, I take a futuristic approach to this. It's in the future. Uh, but at the same time, we need to hear first the letters to the churches that Jesus is going to address because those are now. We're hearing Jesus addressing the church and if you read those seven letters to the seven churches uh, you can see that there are seven different types of churches. Now were they literal churches? Possibly. Probably. Um, and were they, did they have the characteristics that were being written here? Probably. But then if you look at the church over the ages, you can see how the church fit the mold of those seven churches. And if you look at the church today, would you say the church is kind of lukewarm? And we have a lukewarm church? That's the last church that we talk about. 
we all want to be Philadelphia. We all want to be the loving church. And I encourage us, we can be that church. But that doesn't happen because of what we do. Uh, it doesn't happen because of we're following a set of rules and that's how we become the loving church. It's, it happens here. Remember, we are the church. We are the church. And so when we have a change of heart, when we live like the Church of Philadelphia, we become the Church of Philadelphia. When we live like the Laodiceans, we act like the Laodiceans, and we become the Laodiceans. And so it really is an attitude that we have about how we choose to live our life for Christ. And so I say, let's live like Philadelphians. Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, right? Uh, you know, and I don't care for the city. I, I come from New York. I'm from Queens. You know, so, uh, but I do like the idea of having a family that shares brotherly love and that we emanate that to the community. We show the community that we are a church that loves them. We are people that loves them and we welcome them because that's how Jesus lived. And so that's how we should live. Today's message is titled, Jesus Spoke, John Wrote. I could uh, enhance the overview of this letter, but I'm not going to. I'm going to let the letter overview itself and open up uh, the letter to itself. We begin our study with Revelation chapter 1 in verse 1, where we read, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, things which must take, shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God, and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things he saw. So we begin with the author of this book, Jesus Christ, as directed by God to show his servants. That includes us. As believers, as servants of Jesus Christ, we are having a letter written to us from him, John just wrote it for us so that we can read it. All scripture is inspired by God. This scripture takes it to the next level. This is not only being inspired by God, but it's being spoken by God through Jesus Christ. So um, it's kind of exciting that we are hearing things that apply to us, that prepare us, that encourage us, and that gets our heads back in focus. The world will tell us things that try to get us off track and try to get us focused on other things. There's many things in the world that people believe you know there there are people that are into different exercises and and all this other stuff and and bodily exercise profits a little uh, there it isn't that we shouldn't you know and there are many different things that we can do in the world to make our life more comfortable in the world but the fact is we're not going to be spending the rest of our eternity in this world and so we should be preparing ourselves for the next world, for the world to come. You know, my passport is from the United States, but I have a heavenly passport. I just, I haven't had any stamps in it yet because I haven't been there. Paul has, he got a stamp. But we're, we're going to be experiencing that shortly, I believe. So the term... Things which must shortly take place, it actually means 
quickly, in a short period of time, those things will take place. When you think, well, Jesus was here 2,000 years ago. Well, of course, but his time span is much different than ours. You see, when you're from eternity to eternity, when you're the Alpha and the Omega, uh, you know, 2,000 years is like, that's dinner. Okay, what's next? So he has a different time span for us. And, and we, as humans, we get really caught up in minutia, in the details of things, the daily details of things. So for us to try to think eternally, it's very hard for us. You know, I, I watched my children grow up and now they're in their 30s. Our daughter is the youngest. She'll be 30 next year. And it's like, wow, it went by really, really fast. When I was 19, I didn't, first of all, I didn't expect to make it to 50. And now I'm going to be 65. And I'm thinking, really? This happened? I don't, I don't know how it happened. I really don't. But I'm here. So I, I can, you know, verifiably say it happened. I can't remember most of it, but it happened. Are you guys experiencing some of that too? You know, it, it, you think back and it's like, that, that's why people have so many problems when they get older. The husband says, oh, do you remember when? And the wife says, no, that didn't happen. And, you know, they get into an argument about what happened and what didn't happen. Forget about it. Make up your own stories. Just believe what you want. It doesn't make any difference anyway. No one believes you. So John is reporting everything he heard and saw. And the Holy Spirit is reminding him of all the details. Here, here's some good news for us. It, it, it comes in verse 3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. There's no other book in the Bible. There's no other letter in the Bible that says that. Blessed is whoever reads it or hears it. You have to remember, a lot of those people didn't read in those days. And so, reading it or hearing it is going to bless us if we keep the things which are written in it. And that's important because it ends with, for the time is near. The day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples and when he came upon them he filled them and they were able to speak in other languages and they were able and what were they speaking they were speaking about the wonderful works of God that's what they were speaking and all of the people heard them they were from all the other nations and they were there listening saying these guys speak our language but they're Galileans these are fishermen. Who taught them? Fish don't speak. Who, who taught them these languages? And they're speaking about the wonderful works of God. And we, now 2,000 years later, have all of that information. We have all the wonderful works of God that have been given to us and shared with us. Quite often we read the Bible from a historic perspective, but do not receive the personal portion of what the scriptures are speaking of. It's speaking to us. The scripture wants us to be part of the story. Not just looking at it from, oh, that's what happened back then. No, that's what's still happening today. We're living the story. 
and time is short. Every generation needs to believe that because if they didn't believe that, they wouldn't have been prepared because, you know, all the other generations before us, where are they now? One of two places. They're either with the Lord or they're in, in the holding box, the penalty box. They're going to be there until judgment day. But the bodies are still here. That'll be something to see when the graves are emptied from the believers and they go home to be with the Lord together. I've been discussing this with a few people lately and everybody's like, well, will our bodies stay here? No, our bodies are not going to stay here uh, in, in the rapture. It's not just our spirit. Why? Why? Well, I'll tell you why. Because if our bodies stayed here in the rapture, how many people die every day? Thousands of people die every day. And so people would be confused. Hold on, I know that guy. He's a criminal. He's evil. And what, he went with the rest of them? No, I believe our bodies are going because every example we've had the bodies went, right? Enoch, Elijah. We've had examples of those who have gone up to be with the Lord. So I believe our bodies, are, because it would be a mess if they weren't. It would be confusing to many be people. You know, Maybe our clothes won't be going with us. We'll get new clothes on the way. That's how come it's going to happen in the twinkling of an eye, so we're not naked, <laughs> you know, Okay. That's not biblical. I just made that up. I just want to let you, someone's going to take that and put it on YouTube. Anyway, we're blessed reading this. Uh, the, the reason we should keep these things because the time is near is because people that are living right now in this time, they're not sure what's going on. If you grew up in the 50s and 60s and saw what was happening today, you would say, what happened? What happened? I'll tell you what happened. Those teenagers and young adults from the 60s, they became adults. And they brought their inebriated and, uh, and, and drug-induced bodies into the present day. And they're leading the country now. So in reality, that's part of the reason why we're seeing what we're seeing. People abandoned God in the 60s. And they continued doing that through the, and they came up with reasons why we didn't need Jesus decade after decade after decade. And now they teach in the schools evolution as a fact, not as a theory. And so if you want to believe you came from an ape, go right ahead. Why are there still apes? Um, if you want to believe that, you, you, you can feel free to believe that. But I would rather believe what God said and what God tells us in his word. And so I believe the time is near. He created our whole space-time continuum. He created it all. It doesn't matter which TV show you watch. You know, I, there are some amazing, I love sci-fi, you know. Never really enjoyed Stargate, but Star Trek, that was cool, you know. Uh, you know. But some people like Stargate, and it's like stepping through into another dimension and everything. I believe that that's what it truly is like. In I don't think heaven is someplace outside of our galaxy, out of our universe. I believe... It's right here, it's just in a different um, you know, universe. It's in a, 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 we're gonna step from here into there. And it, it's, I don't know. God didn't reveal that to me either. 
So, and I'm not a prophet, but I read prophecy. And I trust the prophecies that we have been given by the prophets. When I was growing up, I thought all of this was just a bunch of hogwash until I actually believed, until I became a believer. And then it became real to me. Unless you're a believer, it can't be real. But how do you become a believer? That's the hard part. We need to trust. That's what faith is all about. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It doesn't say faith comes by reading. It says faith comes by hearing. So you can hear the word of God. And if you trust the word of God, the truth of the word of God, you can have faith. And you can grow that faith by reading and hearing his word. I think he confirms that here. Verse 4. And John, now John is writing. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So John is opening now with a greeting from God the Father. Grace and peace to the one who is and was and who is to come. He's always been, is right now, and will always be. That's who Jesus is. That's who God is. Jesus was at the beginning. Some people think, oh, he wasn't here until, you know, 30 AD or... or actually a little before, and then he died in, in 30, 33 AD, somewhere around there. Um, and, and that's when Jesus came in to being. Well, no, it says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that's Jesus was there with him. And all things were created by them and by him. So we don't deserve God's grace, but he gives it to us daily. We need it because we wouldn't, be, we wouldn't be able to endure what we endure unless we had the grace of God. I mean, we can endure, but we'd be miserable all the time. If you're miserable all the time, you just need a little more grace. God doesn't run out of grace. And he doesn't limit grace based on your age, based on the color of your hair, based on any. He gives grace abundantly to whoever needs it, whoever asks for it. He supplies it to us. Jesus also said we can have peace in John 16, 33. He said, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. He overcame the world, so we can now have peace because he is our peace. Peace means that we can be calm no matter what turmoil is going on around us. Whatever is going on personally in our lives, we can have peace. comes from trusting Jesus so deeply that everything happening around us is just inconsequential. It doesn't matter because we trust him through it all. And when we put our God first in our lives, then everything else falls into place. There's also a mention of the seven spirits here. It, it's not seven individual spirits. It's one spirit, seven characteristics of a spirit. This is what Isaiah mentioned in his text in uh, Isaiah, uh, where was it? Isaiah 11.2. He talks about the seven spirits of God, the seven characteristics of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, that's 
something that we'll get more into as we go on through the text. But Jesus is mentioned next, and this verse fully describes him. Uh, First, he is the faithful witness. That word witness means martyr. It's the same word for martyr. And he is the first faithful martyr. He is also a Christian witness because he is Christ as a witness to the world. And he's the first one that came from the dead. There is no other person that died and then rose from the dead to demonstrate their power over life and death. See, if Jesus went to the cross and died for us and never rose again, then we would have to question, did what he said, was it true? You know, remember the apostles struggled with that. What, we we thought he was the Messiah. And they, if they believed everything Jesus taught and they trusted in him explicitly, they would have been there the third day. Because they would have remembered, he said, on the third day, I'm going to rise again. And they would have been there. The woman went to the tomb not to see him because they knew he was going to rise again. They were just going there to fix him up because that's what you do. You bring spices and and you rewrap. And that's what they did in those days. And so that's why they were going to the tomb not expecting him to be alive. Mary was crying. Oh, what did you do with the body? Remember? And, you know, she wasn't expecting to find him alive. And so then when they did find him alive, when he came to them, they were shocked. They were panicking. He arrives in the upper room and there he is. And, you know, they were frightened. They were, all the doors were locked. The windows were locked. How did he get in here? And that's you know, why I believe uh, heaven is just half a dimension away. It's, he can show right up at any time. And so there he is, the firstborn from the dead, proving that he had power over life and death. And that's why we trust him today. Because he proved that he had that power. No one else has ever been able to do that. So uh, finally we read that Jesus is going to be the ruler over all the kings of the earth. Well, a lot of people have a struggle. with. Well, it doesn't appear that he is right now. Well, he won the battle at the cross. He hasn't finished assuming control and authority. He's going to do that. He's going to come. He's going to establish his throne in Jerusalem. That's all happening. We're going to read about that in this letter. We're going to get all the details. We're going to fill in all those blanks because all of that is in this letter. And so John finishes up with this beautiful picture that Jesus loving us so much, he shed his blood for our sin. And not only did he do that, then he washed us and he cleansed us. And hold on, you know what he did first? He loved us. Well, you know, that's what it says here in verse 5. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins. Look at the order. He loved us before he washed us. He loved us while we were still sinners. Not these perfect human beings we are today. (laughs) Right? You see, he continues to love us when we act like we do. When we get angry and we shouldn't. When we get frustrated at how things are going. When he said, I've got it all under control. Don't worry about it. My father used to say that all the time when I was young. He used to say, oh, don't worry about it. I've I've got, I know what I'm going to do, I'm going to do. And he really didn't. He just said that. (laughs) You see, and and that's why I was always suspicious, you know. By the time I was a teenager, I was like, 
he's lying, <laughs> you know. But he always tried to comfort me that way. But God, when God says, I've got it under control, it's absolutely true. And he's never showed me that he, was, he didn't have it under control. He's proven time and time and time again. He's got it under control. And so I can trust him through all of this. Verse 6, And he has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Kings and priests. Us. That's us. We don't feel like it. We look at other people and say, oh, that person will be, make a good priest or that person will make a good king. Or... But we don't look at ourselves that way because when we get up in the morning, we look in the mirror and we know who we are. We know that we have faults. We know we're not perfect. And we struggle with the fact that God is going to give us authority. He's going to put us in positions that we're not worthy of. For your information, you're not worthy. Neither am I. None of us are. We're not righteous. But he sees us as righteous because of what Jesus did. He looks and says, that's a righteous person. Really? You know, because I saw them driving to Costco yesterday and I, I saw them. They, they're not righteous. They cut off three people. But, uh, you know, he doesn't see that. He sees us completed. He's doing a work in us and he's going to complete that work. He's the one that's going to complete the work in us. He's the perfecter of our faith. And we just don't see that. We don't understand that. Because we're human. It's going to happen someday. I don't go around trying to be perfect. I'll be honest with you. I don't do it. I don't try to be... I try to get my hair right. That's about as far as I get. You know, but I don't go around trying to be perfect. I, I try to be a person that I would like to meet. Really, that's, I try to be a person that I would like to be friends with and, and meet and, you know, and have a relationship with, a friendship with. That's what I try to be because, uh, you know, that's about the best I can do. And then I allow the Holy Spirit to do the rest because... The people that I do meet and the people that I try to engage, I can't really do much for them. I'm not independently wealthy, as my daughter thinks. But, <laughs> um, but uh, you know, I have the riches of God living within me. You know, we, we don't have all the knowledge in the world, but we have the mind of Christ because he lives within us. That's what we're really getting to here is the fact Jesus is not going to set us up to be the church without giving us everything we need to be the church. That's what this letter is preparing us for. It's setting us up. How do we want to be the church? What do we want to look like? And then as we read the seven churches, we have to decide which one we want to be in. Please don't go looking for Philadelphia. Go, don't go looking for the Philadelphian church. I want to be that church, the faithful church. Don't go looking for that church. Be that church. So that we become that church and people are drawn to the love of God through us, through our body, through our church. Because if you go to another church looking to find that perfect church, 
you just ruined it. I, I've never found the perfect church, but I know that wherever I am, if I'm called by God, that's the perfect church for me because that's where God wants to use me to do what he wants to accomplish. And that's for all of you too. That's how God accomplishes his purposes through groups of people that work together to minister, to share, to encourage one another, to pray for one another, and to cook food together. Woohoo! That's right, you can sign up after service. So, <laughs> yeah, always comes down to food, right? Well, we're going to have the, the, the supper of the Lamb, this big wedding feast we're going to have in heaven, right? You know, the Bible talks about it. We should be looking forward to it. It's going to be good food. And it's not going it, to... It's, never mind. Anyway, <laughs> behold, he's coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. And so all the tribes of the earth, even those who have pierced him. And so are we talking about the rapture? No. Because the rapture isn't going to be where the whole world gets to see him. And, and it's going to be in a moment. He's coming in the clouds. We're going to go away. That's how come I love cloudy days. I don't know. Is today the day? Nope, no clouds. But he's coming in the clouds and it's going to be so quick and we're going to be gone. But when he comes the second time with all of the saints, the whole world will know. The whole world will see. And those that pierced him will even see at that point. I don't know how that's going to work. I don't know, I don't have all the answers because it's not spelled out clearly for us. But what I know is that's what it says, so that's what's going to happen. That's faith. That's just believing what God tells us. And I know it's good. there's nothing else in the Bible that contradicts that. And so I can believe it and take it to heart. So... In Zechariah 12.10, we read, And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, that they will look on me whom they had pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. You see, Zechariah was seeing what's going to take place. At that time, Zechariah chapter 12 is the end times prophecy of what is going to take place in those last days. But it's the Jews that are going to mourn that pierced him, but it's not them, it's the whole world. Jesus says in Matthew 24, 30, then the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. They're going to see him coming. Jesus said that. He's talking about himself. And they're all going to see, they're all going to mourn. Even so, let it be. Jesus makes a final statement to John as an introduction to this book in verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Jesus identifies himself as God. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God. He identifies himself as God here, the Alpha and the Omega. You remember what the writer of Hebrews said? He said, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's God, and he's not going to change. He's the Almighty. The Greek word is pantocrator, and that means the one who has everything in his hand. Is that cool? The one who has everything in his hand. Pantocrator. So we close considering 
who our Lord is, what he's done for us. He not only came to save us, but he's preparing a place for us. He's a carpenter that never has anything out of square. He's got everything perfect, but he's not up there with a hammer and nails preparing everything. But he is preparing a place for us. Every one of us, he's preparing a place. And I'm looking forward to seeing what that's going to look like. Jesus spoke and John wrote, and now we can be blessed because we're hearing it, because we're reading it. We're the ones who are blessed. The ones who don't deserve to be blessed, we're being blessed by this very text. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen.